to know one person's work of art and I've tried to choose someone who may not be familiar to everyone but who is getting increasing art historical attention is probably going to be doing exhibitions in the UK soon because his paintings are amazing and it's actually hard to do a class on them because you really have to see them in person which is quite unusual for a painter especially like a colourful painter normally it's still nice to look at them on a screen but his paintings are really massive um, I've tried to include a few images that give you a sense of scale, but when you're in an exhibition looking at them, they, are, they have such an impact. So hopefully, once we do this class in years to come, you will be able to visit one of his exhibitions in the UK and will appreciate his work as much as me. This particular painting, um, which is called The Cloud Madonna, is one of my favourite paintings of all time i love it this isn't the whole painting um it's slightly zoomed in but i love it if, if i did a class on my favorite paintings this would be this would be in there and it's really really big as well just generally i really love his paintings of um of women i really like them especially pregnant women which you don't see very often he he paints them um in illustrations and paintings and posters so yeah and I really like his style it's very it's not pretentious it's it's not simple either um, but it's just so inviting and actually conceals a super super complicated man and a super complicated history that if you quiz me too much on I won't be able to tell you because I'm still getting to grips on it myself. Um, that's a good segue actually, I, I should say this class will be mainly focused on Native American history I suppose because um, this artist TC Cannon is Native American. Um, but I've always found it difficult with Native American history because Obviously, there are some key dates, like key moments of, like horrendous moments, to be honest, in the essentially genocide of native populations in America, um, particularly in the 1830s when there was something called the Trail of Tears, where Native American populations were expelled and forced to do this massive migration, essentially to the margins of America, where they now often live in reservations. So there are decades where there are these big important historical moments, but generally it's, it's a very slow process, like the destruction of Native American populations. It happened over centuries in a really insidious way that involved tricking different tribes into signing treaties and seeming like it was legal, but actually, you know, massive coercion and um, yeah, in that sense, it's a difficult history to like learn and memorize because it's made up of so many very ambiguous moments. Um, and it's only when you zoom out that you realize just how tragic it is that we've like, that humanity has treated these cult, these many different cultures so badly across America. So, um, oh, so let me just change um let me just change my vision okay there we go um we will start though my interruption means i i'm not going to do a smooth segue into this i'm just gonna quickly do a tangent before i get into tc cannon because i yeah i really want to talk about this we will just quickly <laughs> mention um, some American artists who've responded to the election because I couldn't help myself. It was so topical last week. It's people have kind of moved on now, but I couldn't do the class last week. So I'm going to put in this random tangent anyway. I just want you in your own time, if you want to, um, to look at this American artist called Kara Walker 
we're going to come back to this. I'm just going to quickly let someone into the class. There we go. Thank you for telling me, by the way, because I can't, um, someone just asked me to let uh, Chris into the class because I can't see once I share my screen who's joined. So hopefully everyone's here. If anyone else joins, just let me know. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to, to mention some American artists who've responded to the election because we're going to be based in America today anyway. Um, Cara Walker is an artist who I really, really like and who you may be familiar with because she did this big installation at the Tate Modern. And I think we've looked at one of her fountain installations before. Um, she does these huge sculptures, very, very critical of colonial history. And she's really famous for these silhouettes of um, slave history, actually, that tell these stories in this huge format. Um, a super interesting way of telling history. And she did this absolutely hilarious installation, very stylized in her typical way of painting that I really liked. And there's so many contemporary American artists responding to the US election and I just thought we had to include some of them and I tried not to make it Kahinde Wiley so I picked another artist, Cara Walker, who I really like so I just thought I would include her. Um, but I will go back to TC Cannon now. Not all too different because we're still based in America and we're still going to be talking about someone who's also very critical of colonial history. But TC Cannon is a bit more ambiguous about his criticisms of colonial history. Um, and we'll get onto that, we'll get onto that. So I'll start with the very basics, which I will read to you. TC Cannon was born in Lawton in Oklahoma to a Kiowa father and a Caddo mother. So two different uh, Native American tribes. And he uh, joined the Institute of American Indian Arts, um, which was based in Santa Fe in New Mexico, and which was established in the 70s because a group of artists that he knew very well, essentially a big group of friends who were Native American, felt like they needed to establish some kind of school because it had just been too long that the Native Americans had been totally excluded from the art world. Um, I mean, we're in the 1970s now, and you know from the last few classes about the avant-garde and all this stuff happening in Europe and America, um, that this is really late to the game. Um, it's not to say that Native American artists hadn't been producing art before, they absolutely had, but they decided they needed some kind of institution that was just for them, in order to like do something about this massive marginalization. Um, the other reason I picked TC Cannon this week actually is because we've done so much Euro-American stuff um, and that is really the mainstream of art history and there's so many other artists that aren't even really fringe artists like there were massive movements gathering around them, but it's just that art history has had this very tunnel vision. Um, once you go into artists like TC Cannon, you'll realize like there's so much to, yeah, there's so much you can explore. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned, we've done a little bit too much Jackson Pollock, potentially, but I, I also wanted to put in, remind you of this whole, masculinity thing that we looked at with Jackson Pollock because I he was the epitome of like the individual male traumatized genius you know like the unstable man who is you know has so much within that he can release and he's the genius and blah 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 which is a story that gets told about so many men in art history Pollock Picasso like all of the big men um, and I was almost disappointed at myself when I chose a man, like to dedicate the only class that was going to be dedicated to one individual artist to a man. But hopefully by the end of this class, it will be justified and it won't come across that way. But 
you should keep that in mind, to be honest, in the class, whether I'm glorifying this one individual figure too much because you're allowed to be critical. Um, and I also, before we dive in, although I always do so many <laughs> things before we actually dive in, I just wanted to quickly remind you of the other uh, Native American artists that we've looked at in the class so far, like Wendy Redstar, who's a feminist uh, artist who, these collages, which I love, are just one small part of her, the work that she does, and I'm not gonna go over it because we already did it. But Wendy Redstar is much more contemporary, like she's still alive. Um, whereas TC Cannon is part of this group of 1970s and 80s Native American artists who really laid the groundwork um, for their communities to enter the art scene. Um, and it's still very much new, like, you know, Native American artists are still uh, marginalized. Uh, so yeah, this is Wendy Redstar. We also looked at um, Native American Orientalist advertising, so I won't go over that. Um, and we looked at Sonny Asu as well, who does these absolutely hilarious, um, um, what's the word? Serial packets, uh, where he changes all of the words to make political statements like treaty states and 100% government bullshit and all this stuff. And it's really, um, it's really clever if you know the context of, you know, how much Native Americans were abused by the advertising interests, by the advertising industry. It's really clever that he goes back and does his own kind of abuse back at them. So these are some of the artists that we've um, looked at so far. This is one of Wendy Redstar's uh, installations where she um, basically pasted lots of important Native American women onto the land that they used to own to make a point about the fact that Native American communities were often matriarchal and women owned the land and it was only um, like Anglo-American values that impose the patriarchy basically so she's an amazing feminist and um yeah i just wanted to remind you of these other amazing artists to look at but we're going to look at tc cannon because he he really um he laid the foundation in the sense that before this institute was established in new mexico i think potentially among native american communities there was a fear that they shouldn't step into the Anglo-American art world. They shouldn't exhibit in their museums, um, not that they would have been accepted anyway because of you know, how closed-minded the art world was, but there was a fear that basically they should stay within their own definition of art and in their own communities. Um, and TC Cannon and a load of other artists, some of whom we'll look at today, really broke that barrier and said, no, we have a place just as much as Anglo-American artists to display our art to wide audiences in gallery settings. And these two pictures here show you the scale, kind of, of his paintings. You, you get a bit of a sense. They're really, really, really big. And I just have to stress that because when you look at them on the screen, they don't look like they're going to be massive. It's not like when you look at a Jackson Pollock painting and you know it's huge. These paintings are big. So we're going to start, let me see if we're going to start with this one or the next one. Um, oh, actually, I should read this quote because it kind of summarizes what I just said much better than me. So TC Cannon, according to one critic, uh, fearlessly departed from what was until then American Indian art and its traditional definitions. He contributed to redefining native art and the view that many people had of Native America. He placed himself in the history of modern painting until then reserved only for white people. Uh, so how did he do that? Well, firstly, by embracing post-impressionism, which we've looked at over the past few weeks now. Um, he incorporated the colors and the brush strokes and the general like lack of um, commitment to realism into his paintings, um, which was risky for 
a community that had always been, you know, I mean, destroyed by Anglo-American European values to turn around and embrace one of the most characteristically European, you know, French almost styles of painting. Um, but he, he dared to, to do that. He embraced post-impressionism. His paintings in terms of their color might remind you of Cezanne, most likely of Matisse maybe, who we looked at. And also uh, Natalia Goncharova. And I think the main, oh, Gauguin we did look at, yeah. I wanted to put in a picture of Van Gogh. That was what I was really looking for, but it's not here anyway. Um, because he even did this painting of himself uh, standing by a famous Van Gogh painting. And you have to understand like how radical this is for Native American art history, for a Native American painter to be situating himself in relation to these European artists. It's really, it's really crazy considering everything that those communities have been through and how fraught their relationship with European culture is. And um, we have to treat this as a symbol of power on TC Cannon's behalf, because whenever Europeans dip into cultures that are not their own, for example, Orientalist paintings, it's seen as kind of their right to do so, a symbol of confidence on their behalf, a symbol of creativity. Whereas marginalized communities, if they dip into a culture that's not their own, like a dominant culture, like European culture, it's always interpreted by art historians as like this crippling lack of self-confidence that leads them to desperately cling to a culture that's not their own and be really inauthentic and blah, blah, blah. Um, and now increasingly art historians are looking at this and saying, actually, these people, when they turn around and embrace European culture and reinterpret it and incorporate it into their own work, it's actually also a sign of confidence and power and appropriation on their behalf. And if you look at this painting of TC Cannon, I think it really makes that point because he's so assertive in his pose. Like this self-portrait is so clear to me. Like it's saying, I deserve to be part of this history. I'm absolutely in parallel with these great European men and I can be myself and maintain my identity in the meantime. Um, so yeah, this, I mean, this debate that I've just briefly touched on is quite a, explosive debate in our history but um but i hope i've i've more or less summarized it um and tc cannon is a great example but you can read more into it and maybe i can give some some reading on that so some examples that prove my point are paintings like this um which is a nod to manet's olympia and I wonder, maybe I haven't put it up. I wonder if I'm, I'm showing an old version of the PowerPoint anyway. Manet's Olympia, um, I've shown it so many times in this class, I think you already know. Maybe I can do it actually. Can you still see my screen if I do this? Get it up. Okay, I'm hoping you can see this. <laughs> if someone's kindly telling me, yes, you can see the screen. Okay, so this is the famous painting that I'm always going on about, Manet's Olympia, which is referenced by so many artists. And in the 20th century class, we talked a bit about how radical this painting was at the time, because it was looking back to the Renaissance and rejecting all the traditional conventions of painting, blah, blah, blah. This is T.C. Cannon's take on this European tradition of the reclining nude. This is his own interpretation. And you can see that he's totally unafraid to combine this European subject matter with very uh, traditional native symbols and colors and patterns. So he doesn't see a disconnect between the two. He doesn't feel like he has to commit to one or the other. Um, which again, 
is, is not a sign of a lack of cultural self-confidence. It's actually a sign of the opposite. It's him being really assertive and claiming his position in art history, in the history of art. Um, this is my best example of canon my best example this is my favorite example of canon's fusion approach um this is his interpretation of uh the virgin uh, he calls it the cloud madonna um and i included a little snippet of the exhibition label um because it's really difficult to find information about this painting uh, but it basically explains that he's taken this very traditionally European religious figure and nativized her by um, making her carry water on her head instead of wearing a halo. He keeps the traditional red and blue um, colours that normally signify the Virgin Mary, um, but basically makes them his own. So he's really claiming his right to reinterpret art history however he however he wants um, and it's challenging for the viewer because it makes you realize that when you think of a Native American artist you have all these preconceptions about what Native art might be and you think you're going to learn all these you know things about their authentic culture and something so different to you and actually um, he's such like if you're a european viewer he's really situating himself in your history he's giving you recognizable symbols like the virgin mary and the madonna and the reclining nude uh and yet twisting them slightly so this is why i find them like complicated images to look at um you know super super beautiful but they're definitely they don't have an easy explanation or a simple you know, you, I, I can't just explain them. It's not like they tell an easy narrative story. Um, I feel, you know, potentially I'm just overcomplicating them, but this is just what these paintings say to me. Um, why did I include the, um, this um, mass in Brazil, which we, looked at in or which we looked at in Orientalist painting? I've just looked at my notes. This is because I wanted to make the point, which I've already made, because I always get ahead of myself, about the fact that um, Europeans have depicted indigenous cultures so much throughout history um, in these really stereotypical ways. And um, it just reinforces the fact that when native artists go back and appropriate elements of European culture, it's a real, what's the word that isn't rude? It's a real like, <laughs> I don't want to say anything rude. <laughs> it's a real comeback to, um, to the history of art, you know? It's a real comeback to their exclusion from the history of art. So it's interesting. These are just some of the examples that we looked at in the class. Slap in the face, exactly. Thank you to the person who's helped me with that. It's a real slap in the face, I think. Um, these are some of the other examples of um, in, uh, Orientalist art that depicts indigenous people that we looked at in the class on Brazil. Different part of the world, but if you want to go back to that class, you may. Um, this painting of his mum and dad is one of T.C. Cannon's most, 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 um, yeah, most famous paintings, basically, because what he does is he combines the traditional dress of his mum and dad with very contemporary, modern Anglo-American symbols like sunglasses, cigarettes, diners, um, and all of this stuff. And this might remind you, again, of some of the feminist art that we looked at in our other class, which did the same thing. You combine these symbols that people have associated with this historical traditionalism and something so foreign, um, and you put them right next to these really jarring symbols of a modernity, like hoovers and Pepsi cans and sunglasses, to make people realize that um, 
these things that you perceive as historical versus modern are actually both completely modern because native people are still alive so their dress isn't historical to them you know um like for a native person this is not necessarily a juxtaposition um but for like an anglo-american viewer it's really confronting i suppose so yeah this is one of his most famous paintings and this orientalist painting again from the orientalist class um is just to remind you um, that one of the things that I told you about Orientalist painting back in the day, back in the day, a few months ago, <laughs> is that um, European painters, when they were sent to the colonies to paint, would often never, never, never include any modern symbols. No sunglasses, no modern dress, no cars, no televisions, just nothing that would remotely suggest that you were living in the 19th and 20th centuries. Everything was old, broken, um, derelict, ancient things. And this painting that you're looking at on the screen is um, famous only because it includes a newspaper, which is absolutely radical for Orientalist paintings because like the populations that were depicted often colonized populations were never depicted as intelligent enough to be reading the news or up to date enough to be reading the news the very fact that there's a newspaper in this image places it in the 20th or 19th century at least um which uh is not often the case with orientalist paintings they're often made to look more old um, so when marginalized artists come back and like so jarringly put modern elements into their paintings, it's another slap in the face. <laughs> um, I think this, the reason why we're doing TC Cannon so late in this series of classes is because I just find that his paintings reference so many things, um, that it really helps to have some kind of background otherwise they just look like very 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 beautiful paintings which they are but to me i think they have all these layers behind them and he was a very complicated person which we'll get to so it's likely to be the case um yeah so someone has said that the modern props are a deliberate plan to provoke viewers um and make you question where native americans are now so it's, it's like an exaggerated contradiction, which is exactly the point. Um, I guess it just, um, it makes you realize that you didn't necessarily assume that you were looking at something contemporary when you looked at Native American art. Like maybe you, you immediately assume you're going to be looking at something old and you forget that these people are very much still alive. Um, so yes. We're now going to look at some of Cannon's most political um, paintings, like paintings that literally have direct political symbols in them, like this one, which is called Washington Landscape with Peace Medal Indian. Um, again, beautiful painting. I love it. And it's huge. It's huge, this painting. Um, but you have the typical contrast of old um like the traditional dress with the feathers and new with the top hat which actually for native american populations isn't a juxtaposition at all because if we go back to wendy red star these photos that she took um in 2014 were photocopies of photos from 1880 where um basically documenting this big peace delegation where a Native American community would go to Washington DC and they would dress in their best clothes and they would be uh, sitting with all these Anglo-Americans wearing top hats and they would try and negotiate land and would be tricked and um, what's the word manipulated out of it. Um, so for Native Americans for centuries they'd always been negotiating this kind of top hat versus feather hat um, juxtaposition like it would be normal for them to have both 
in their wardrobe for really for centuries now but because we're so used to seeing these communities marginalized we don't realize that um that that's the case for them that they would um kind of have both wardrobes i suppose like they dress both you know they might have a pair of jeans and a traditional costume and that's a very normal part of their life so that's the point that he's making with this juxtaposition um but more politically what you'll see in the background um is the u.s capital through the window and what he's wearing i think i have the specific name of the medal that he's wearing yeah he's wearing what they call a peace medal which was a gift given by the u.s government to symbolize their friendship with the native americans and commemorate an agreement um it's now recognized that the agreements were if not done in bad faith, then totally uh, fraudulent, like maybe fraudulent isn't the right word. Well, fake. Um, so these peace medals mean absolutely nothing really to <laughs> Native Americans. Um, so by, by, putting, by putting this peace medal literally in the center of the painting, um, but making sure that the top hat has been taken off i feel like he's basically saying like we know the trick that you played on us and um we're like we're sticking to our own culture like i've chosen to wear my feather hat instead of this top hat and another thing that critics said in the exhibition that i went to see is that he purposefully puts the um government building so far in the background that it becomes obvious that these communities are well aware that they have nothing to do with u.s politics they're totally out of it they have they're not included in any way shape or form and it has no effect on their life and these little symbols of peace and friendship aren't going to make a difference to the fact that they have no political power um which is just yeah really heartbreaking and i think for me i i also became more interested in these paintings and native american history after going to new zealand because you, there you can really see how different the government's approach is to their indigenous history like any time a building is consecrated or anything new or any change in land you have um you have to have approval from indigenous communities who come and who do the kind of consecration of the building together with um you know their equivalent of a local mp it's just so clear to me that um native american native populations there play such a bigger part in political life and they have their own representatives um and it's really not the case in the us which is which is really sad um someone just said it would be interesting to see what native americans looking at these paintings see as we often view them from western sensibilities and different ethnic ethnicities bring in their own cultural background into what they see absolutely definitely it would be um it would be really interesting i think I think among, from what I've read, among Native communities, he has a mixed reputation. Um, because as we'll see later, like in a, in a later, in a couple of minutes, um, some of his other contemporaries from the uh, Institute of Indian American Arts, I think it was called in New Mexico, um, were much more overtly critical than TC Cannon. So we will, um, we will, yeah, get into that. Um, actually, that's literally the next thing on my notes. I'm going to read you this quote because it will answer this better. The reason why Cannon doesn't sit so easily in the boundaries of contemporary identity politics is because he blurs the boundaries. He felt entitled to both cultures, Western and Native. And someone else said, Cannon was averse to binaries. He didn't draw simple lines between Native and non-Native people. 
um, he preferred mashups between native and non-native elements, and he never shied away from the complexity and nuance of identity politics, which I think is absolutely true. Like the interpretation that I've given you of this painting, you know, the removal of the hat being a rejection of native culture, you could totally interpret it in a different way. In many ways, this painting is ambiguous. Like you could also say that he's, um, you know, making this native person look like a potential US government official. Like, it is true, it is true that he doesn't sit neatly in, um, yeah, he's not an easy person to interpret. Um, but I really, really like that about him. And I think, um, I think it's refreshing, but you can understand how for some native Americans that it might be insulting, for example. Um, yeah, exactly. I imagine it to be the equivalent of Western traditionalist to a modernist. These, please keep these comments coming. I really want to see how other people interpret these paintings because um, that's what I like about TC Cannon is that you have to, yeah, he, does, he doesn't make it easy. Um, this painting is, is probably um, his most famous and the one that best exemplifies this dual identity, um, not dual identity because he was Native American, but this, this feeling of having an entitlement to both cultures. Um, but one of the layers that we will get into in this painting is that T.C. Cannon actually served for the U.S. Army. So his relationship with Anglo-American military culture, whatever you want to call it, was extremely complicated. Um, so even though this painting might look like a very simple division between two cultures, it's actually, it's, it's totally tense. Um, it's totally tense and could almost be seen as insulting to put together these two cultures you know, in this 50-50 balance when there's always been such an imbalance and a division between them. It's really quite mad for this Native American artist to be saying, this is my self-portrait, you know? I accept that there is this European presence that has to be within me because of the history that I've inherited and because of the way colonialism has gone. So this painting is also um, really, really difficult. Um, the other thing, yeah, the other thing I wanted to say is that he's not just incorporating European culture because he's saying, you know, um, this, ha this, this has to be a part of me because of the way colonial history has gone and I have to accept this fusion of two cultures. He's also doing it because he generally and genuinely admired some elements of European culture like Van Gogh, which I've already said, but also lots of um, music that was coming out in the, at the time. This is his portrait of Bob Dylan, and he also wrote his own songs. He was obsessed with Bob Dylan. Uh, and again, this is why, um, leading on from the last question, this is why he's not necessarily always popular among native communities because, and also among just generally, because this could be seen as westernization, you know, which is always interpreted badly. Um, it's always interpreted as like a lack of cultural self-confidence. What I really want to stress is that um, he wasn't giving up one in favor of the other. He really felt like, like this, you know, like this painting depicts. So yeah, he absolutely loved music. I think I have a great quote by him. Oh no, he, no, it's not a quote. It's a nice um, anecdote about this painting. He includes somewhere the word Zimmerman in this painting, which I can't find right now. Oh yeah, here, Zimmerman. Um, and um, I, I went into this Google hole because I, I didn't know this and maybe this is familiar to all of you, but um, Bob Dylan was actually called 
his surname was actually Zimmerman and he changed it because he thought it was too um, Jewish. So what I wanted to say is that even when it seems like Cannon is really embracing you know American culture he's always doing it with an edge you know it's never simple um he's he's bringing out some of its contradictions and he's maybe resonating with them um yeah it's never a simple admiration or uh what's the opposite of admiration rejection he never gives you a simple picture so um yeah and this is a poster that he made for a opera. Which specific opera house was it? Um, it was Muse of a Tosca. I didn't write the opera house. It's one in New Mexico. Uh, anyway, so he, he made this for an opera house who were opening the Tosca in the summer, as you can see down here. Um, and it's because he was actually a massive opera fan. It was his favorite type of music alongside Bob Dylan. And I do have, um, he, he even, he basically wrote a poem where my notes say that he imagined himself voiceless and on the sidelines of an art form that nonetheless defines his emotional world. So that's how he wrote about opera. It's such a beautiful quote. He felt that opera defined his emotional world, but that he was always outside of it because he, he wasn't allowed to love opera because stereotypically he's, he's been excluded from this art form. Um, yeah, which I just think is, is so sad and this image is so striking for bringing together, um, well, for bringing opera into a Native American household and painting it, which is something that we don't realize is happening. Um, yeah, so I really, really love this painting. Uh, it was Santa Fe's Opera House. Anyway, the other reason I included this painting is because he made it the summer before he died. So he died incredibly young, 31, I think he was, uh, in a freak car accident and um, was never able to see the opera that he designed a poster for. And because of this, he, now that he's getting more attention, there's so much speculation about the way that his art would have gone um, because so much of it is so ambiguous in these early stages. Um, and people love to predict whether he would have become more critical uh, towards the end of the civil rights movement or, or who knows. But all we're left with is these very ambiguous paintings and there's just something really that really draws me in about them. Um, so the, the final like important part of Canon's identity and personality alongside Bob Dylan and the opera and the appreciation of um, Van Gogh and post-impressionism is this army element. This, this was a huge influence on him basically. Um, so he enrolled in the US Army in 1966. He was forced to because of the Vietnam War. And he served two years in Vietnam, even earning several military medals. Um, and it's interesting because all of his poetry and his music, like the lyrics that he wrote um, and the drawings that he did, reveal these very, very, very conflicted feelings about the war. Um, even though he was on paper a very successful soldier, this is just one of the poems that he wrote, um, it breathed a yellow smoke into my memory, I have drunk with a young man's terror and grief any nuisance of any naive posture bores me now. So they're really difficult poems to read and you can find more of them online. But basically this was a really difficult subject for him. And he responded by often put, it's putting nuclear explosions into the back of his paintings. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're really difficult. I find though that his paintings are much more ambiguous than his poems, but that's up to you to decide if you agree. 
Um, yeah, let me see if I can find the quote that I'm looking for. So this is what his family said when T.C. Cannon came back from the war. Um, he came back a changed man. He couldn't laugh as easily. He wouldn't open up so much. They go over boys and they come back men. He was quieter, more serious, and he threw himself into painting, drawing, and writing. Um, so it, this was like a hugely, hugely important uh, moment in Cannon's life. And um, yeah, this is, this is one of the most famous paintings that came out of it, Two Guns, where, I mean, it's probably the most beautiful example of how often he started incorporating weapons into his work. Um, and what's interesting about this painting, again, as per usual, is this juxtaposition of the native elements and the European elements, like this very extravagant, strange, out of place chair, the extremely modern guns and warfare, it's difficult to know exactly what's happening in this painting. What historical moment is he referencing? Is this about the Vietnam War? You know, at times I've wondered whether to interpret this painting as a comment on the fact that Native American communities have to take responsibility for the fact that they enrolled often, many of their boys enrolled and took part in the war. Should they be claiming more responsibility? Um, is this a painting about self-defense? It's really, really ambiguous, but very interesting to read in the context of him coming back from Vietnam and just trying to figure out what all of these weapons in the background of these really ambiguous paintings mean. Like, it's really, really, um, yeah, super difficult. Um, another quote that I like from a critic, he relies on the interplay between background and foreground between native and non-native elements, between things we understand and things we don't understand. And all of these things hopefully will bring us to a different place of understanding. So this is how, I definitely feel that with um, T.C. Cannon's paintings, especially because I love, you know, so many of the things that we've done in this class, like feminist art. I love paintings that have a very clear political message. I especially critical paintings. I really think that that's what art, I, I love art that does that. But with TC Cannon, it takes me to this completely different place where I'm never exactly sure what he's saying. I know that he's being critical in some way, but I think he's being just as critical of himself as of anyone else. Yeah, I really, I really, really like that. Like, even though they look like beautiful paintings, you have to really spend a lot of time with them. Um, I can see that I have ignored a question. Who are the people on the flag? Very, very, very good question. I tried so hard to Google and find this out. Um, and I couldn't, I have no idea who they are. I found out about the opera and the opera house, but no one seems to have written about who these people are. Um, this is the other thing about TC Cannon because he's new. I'm really hoping that in the next few years when people start writing about him and maybe doing PhDs on this artist, that there'll be more and more, you know, interviews and archival things coming out and maybe we'll have a clearer picture of who this man was. Um, someone has suggested Malcolm X, which would be right for the timing. Um, which again would be super interesting because there was so much solidarity between Native American communities and the civil rights movement at the moment. Um, yeah, so it definitely could be that. But what a fascinating image. It's so, it's just mad how much is going on in this painting. And I would love to be able to fully understand all of the different symbolism going on in the clothes and the hair pieces because everything that you wear really means something in Native culture. So I feel like there's so much work to be done um, on these paintings. And the amazing thing about the image that we're looking at is that it was just designed to be a poster for an opera, you know? It wasn't designed to be um, some kind of big historical political commentary. Um, and yet he still includes all of these symbols. Um, so yes, the only thing I haven't discussed, which I mentioned is, um, 
this the, the fact of of him being potentially not critical enough and how some of his contemporaries were more critical um this is a painting by Fritz Scholder, who also studied at the Institute of American Indian Art and is much, 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 much more famous than T.C. Cannon. Um, and this is his painting of the Wounded Knee Massacre, which um, was a very, very sad event in Native American history that I need to actually read up about more again. Um, I'll do that in a minute. But this is his basically purposefully, the thing is, the point I wanted to make with this painting is that it's very ambiguous. Like there's no people necessarily, there's no uh, specific date, but yet you know exactly by looking at this painting that something incredibly gruesome and terrible has happened. And he uses the word massacre in the title. So it's really, it's, it's a really difficult painting to look at. It makes you do your research on the historical event. Like I, rem I remember seeing this in an exhibition just generally about animals and it really made me do my research on Native American history. Um, it's also massive. It's a really, really, really big painting, which is really uncomfortable because you're confronted by all this empty space that you don't really know what to do with. And especially white space. Um, it's a very difficult painting to look at. This is, even though it's not literally telling you a story, this is a much more critical, much more obviously critical painting coming out of the same group of artists um, than that provided by T.C. Cannon. Oh, this, is, this gives you an idea of the scale. This is from the exhibition, kind of. Um, this is another painting by Fritz Scholder, which again, is just much more, um, much more critical, yeah, much more obviously critical, much more empowering for Native Americans, much more violent than anything that T.C. Cannon would give you. You know, T.C. Cannon, his people are always sitting with their weapons, they're not actually using them. Um, so yeah, this, this I've just included because if you want to look at any of his contemporaries, anyone like Fritz Scholder, or any of the other artists who are now broadly recognized as the indigenous modernist intersection, then you can click on this actually. Um, but Fritz, uh, sorry, but TC Cannon, this is one of his paintings, is just gives you something much less obviously, much less obviously critical. I mean, Something like this, for example, which reminds me in its kind of goriness of this painting by Fritz Scholder, and yet it's completely different in its tone. So it's, it's, it's up to you, I suppose, to make up your mind on whose paintings you prefer. Politically, I really admire Fritz Scholder's paintings, but there's just something about T.C. Cannon's paintings that I'm drawn to. I love the way that he depicts women, like I said at the beginning, especially in this painting, I really love it. And I love the space that he leaves for you to kind of make your, make your own mind up. And I feel like even though looking at shoulders paintings, you will learn a lot about Native American history, looking at T.C. Cannon's paintings, I think you'll learn a bit more about all of the messy complications um, of Native American communities and often marginalized artists aren't allowed that space to be indecisive, messy, like human really. You, you look at a marginalized artist and it's like a buzzword and you want to, you know, see feminism and all of these buzzwords and you don't kind of allow them space. Well, I, I don't sometimes allow them space to like have mixed feelings about something and maybe not be critical about something. So TC Cannon's been really good for me in that respect. Um, and that's all I really wanted to say about him. I will leave you with another beautiful painting. Actually, no, I'll, I'll leave you with this um, photograph of him, which I really like in his studio. It gives you a good sense of scale.